Okay, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the project website for individuals to view who are unable to attend today. Our team here today, um, I'm Sarah Capriva. I'm a senior associate with Beckett and Raider. I serve as the project lead and work out of the Traverse City office. Rowan Brady is an associate with Beckett and Raider. He works out of our new Grand Rapids office, but is from the area and visits frequently. Elise Crafts um, from Place Crafts. She's located in Traverse City and is assisting us with the community engagement on this project. And Sean Winter, many of you know him. He's the planning director for the city of Traverse City. So let's get started. What's a master plan? A master plan is a policy document that sets long range vision for the community. It includes goals and action items that are to be accomplished over the next five, 10, 15 years. The master plan informs the zoning ordinance. So while the master plan sets the policy, the zoning ordinance is needed to implement that policy. And the master plan is required to be reviewed every five years and updated when necessary. So that's why we're here today during that update of the master plan. The master plan includes various chapters um, covering all different sections of uh, land use planning. So we have housing, transportation, economic development. You'll see from the screen, each of these will be a chapter that will be a component of the master plan in the end. So why are we planning for tourism, specifically if we're covering all of those other topics? And it's because tourism, like any industry, is a part of our community. But unlike retail, manufacturing, or entertainment, it is difficult to point to a specific business or location that is the tourism industry. Tourism is interconnected throughout the city and the region. And if we don't plan for tourism, it can have negative implications on our community. Our goal today is to talk about how we can plan for tourism in a way that ensures high quality of life for residents, but that does not negatively impact the economic driver that is tourism. So Sarah mentioned we'll be using a live polling feature throughout this presentation. So Sarah, if you wanna go ahead and cue that up. So if you have a cell phone available, you can go to the QR code or open a link on your browser to go to this website and enter this code here. I'll also be dropping a SurveyMonkey link in the chat. And so if you don't wish to participate live or you um, just can't figure out the logistics of a phone, feel free to um, input your information into this link as well. And we'll be distributing this link after the presentation for those who weren't able to attend today. So I'll give everyone a minute to, to get logged in here and then we'll move on to the next empty slide. if you want to go to the next one. And so at the top of all these slides, you'll also see you can go to menti.com and input this code. In a minute here. And then the first question that we're going to ask you is to think about what words or phrases come to mind when you think about tourism in Traverse City. So feel free to input that information on your devices and we'll see that pop up on the screen. And feel free to submit more than one phrase or word if there were a couple of things that you that came to mind when you're thinking about this. Common themes there, economy, money, summer. Okay. 
pure water, it's a good one. Craft beer. Vibrant. Okay, I'll give everyone a, maybe one more minute to insert their responses and then we can move on. Sarah, if you want to switch back to the presentation and then go to the next slide. So this article from The Guardian actually came across my feed the other day as I was making this presentation and I wanted to put it right in the presentation because I thought it was really applicable to what we're talking about today. So this article is about Lake, Lake Tahoe. If you're unfamiliar with Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe is located in the Sierra Nevada mountains in Northern California and it is an all season vacation destination. So Traverse City, as I'm sure most of us are aware, is primarily summer centric, but Lake Tahoe in the summer has all the lakes and beaches and the winter has a lot of winter recreation opportunities. And the influx of pandemic re remote workers, second home buyers and congestion have led to residents expressing outrage over the number of people coming into the community. Next slide. The influx of people, both new residents and visitors has sent home prices soaring and the median home price, which is High in 2012 at $345,000 is now $950,000. So that's the median, meaning half the homes are below $950,000 and half of them are above. Each year, roughly 15 million people come to visit the community, which is comprised of just 56,000 full-time residents, which is a ratio of 270 visitors per one resident. And I want to highlight this story to show that communities across the country are grappling with this idea of how to plan for tourism and the implications that the tourism industry has on local communities. And while I think Lake Tahoe is an extreme example of the dynamics between visitors and locals, it does provide a cautionary tale for what happens when we don't plan for tourism and let the tourist industry dictate community relationships. Next slide. In 2020, the Michigan Association of Planning, which is the statewide body for all planners, published this guide titled Master Planning for Tourism, which highlights why communities should be planning for tourism, introduces the concept of sustainable tourism, provides case studies on communities that have been proactive in planning for tourism, and, outline, and outlines some steps that communities can take during the planning process to ensure that they are adequately thinking about the intersection between the tourism industry and local communities. We're gonna cover some of the content in the guide today, and it is available online at planningmi.org. So if we want to go back to Mentimeter, Sarah. And then the next slide. And before we get into content, I would like to think, I would like to gauge how much you think Traverse City's environment, economy, socio-cultural environment, and physical features are influenced by the tourism industry. One being not impacted at all, and 10 being completely impacted. So if you want to Rate each of these factors on a scale of one to 10 in terms of how much the tourism each is influenced these. So on a scale of one to 10, how much does the tourism industry influence Traverse City's natural environment? How much does it influence Traverse City's economy? How much does it influence the socio-cultural environment, which is the quality of life, the physical features, which is comprised of the infrastructure, um, roads, bridges, sidewalks? And if you happen to Got kicked out of MNT, there's that link in code at the top of the screen as well.
So it's like economy is pretty high at a 9.4, all the factors averaging about an eight. Is there if you want to switch back to the presentation? So moving into some specific impacts of tourism, especially the impacts that intersect with the planning field, we've listed some economic and physical impacts of the tourism industry. Most of these are outlined in the guide previously mentioned. So for the economic impacts of the tourism industry, the tourism industry brings outside spending into the local community, meaning that people who come to visit Traverse City spend money that's earned elsewhere bringing dollars into the communities, circulating more money in our local economy. The tourism industry also supports local industries that might not have the consumer base to locally, look, consumer base locally to support operations. Tourism also generates more tax revenue, creates local jobs, and there's more investment in the community. The tourism industry also promotes a diversification of the local economy beyond one or two primary local industries. So the influx of people allow different types of businesses to flourish, leading to diversification. The tourism industry also relies on the importing of goods and services from outside the community to support local operations. And then profits generated from the tourism industry tend to go to outside companies and that money might not stay in the community. Think about the hotel industry, which is run, often run by international companies and firms. And so the profits generated from hotels in Traverse City don't tend to stay in the community and are, set, and are and instead sent to these international companies. The jobs created by the tourism industry also tend to be part-time and low pay, and the increased interest in the community generated by the tourism industry can lead to real estate speculation and rising land and home costs. On the physical impacts of tourism, the increased taxes for, um, generated by tourists are beneficial for public services and infrastructure, but tourism can overwhelm and stretch the capacity of that infrastructure. So Sarah, if you want to switch back to Mentimeter real quick. And so our next slide is asking you to think through the economic impacts of tourism and identify if these impacts are negatively impacting Traverse City, with being a zero, neutrally impacting Traverse City, or positively impacting Traverse City being a two. So zero negative, one neutral, two positive. Feel free to answer one, a couple, or all. We'll give everyone a minute to, to indicate their position on all of these factors. Increased spending from outside the region is coming in as a top positive factor. Jobs that tend to be part-time and low pay and real estate speculation are those lower factors. And again, profits to outside firms appears to be a negative lower factor. Sarah, if you want to go to the next slide in Mentimeter. I ask you to think through the physical impacts of tourism, so increased taxes for public services and infrastructure, and then infrastructure can be overwhelmed. So are these negative, neutral, or positive? And the following maybe what we all expected there. Um, Sarah, if you want to go back to the PowerPoint. Next slide. 
And the socio-cultural impacts of tourism are those that affect the social fabric of a community, or in other words, the quality of life of residents. So the tourism industry creates interactions between locals and those who live outside the community who may not have come into the community otherwise if it weren't for the tourism industry. Tourism also creates a sense of community pride and spirit in the community and results in increased respect for cultural heritage and cultural and historical sites. However, the tourism industry can also diminish the local experience as residents bump up against tourism, compete for space on the sidewalk, parking, space in restaurants and retail. And as previously mentioned, the real estate speculation can increase housing costs. On the environmental side, tourism creates a sense of respect for natural features and recreation assets, but the travel generated by tourists creates greenhouse gases. Tourism can result in the overuse and deterioration of natural features and recreation assets. And the inevitable travel between distant places can bring invasive species into the area. So if you want to switch back to Mentimeter real quick, Sarah, next slide. So thinking through the socio-cultural impacts, are these negative, neutral, or positive influences on the city? The interaction with people from outside the community is the top positive factor. Sarah, if you want to switch back to PowerPoint. The next slide. Some of you may have heard the phrase sustainable tourism before, and I want, wanted to provide one definition. This definition is from the United Nations Global Sustainable Tourism Council, or the G, GSTC. The GSTC states that sustainable tourism takes full account of tourism's current and future economic, social, cultural, and environmental impacts, addressing the needs of visitors, the industry, the environment, and host community, so as we go through the rest of the presentation, think about how these principles can apply to Traverse City or how this definition may differ from your view on what sustainable tourism means. Next slide. George Doxey is a tourism scholar and in 1975, he outlined a timeline for visitor host relationships. This model attempts to capture the stages of how residents feel about tourism and the development of the tourism industry. So the first stage is euphoria, where the visiting destination is a euphoric experience for visitors and the local community welcomes the arrival of visitors and the investment they bring. At this point, there is little planning over the direction of tourism and a little to no interaction between tourists and locals. The second stage is apathy and is often referred to as the neutral stage. Locals have some formal contact with visitors and acknowledge them as a potential economic opportunity. The third stage is annoyance, where the relationship between locals and residents begins to turn negative. Locals will start to see the negative side of tourism and start to clash with visitors. The final stage is antagonism, where displeasure is expressed vocally and physically, and tourists are seen as the root cause of all problems in the community. Obviously, this fourth stage, fourth stage starts to harm the tourism industry overall, as visitors don't want to visit a community where they are outwardly detested. So Sarah, if you want to switch back to Mentimeter. Thinking about these four stages, oops. Oh wait, I guess we missed a slide. Sorry about that group. Um, if we briefly want to rate these environmental impacts from negative, neutral to positive.
Is there, if you want to go to the next question. So thinking about the four stages of Doxy's Iridex model, one, euphoria, apathy, two, apathy, three, annoyance, four, antagonism, where do you see Traverse City at? Apathetic, annoyance, a little antagonistic. That's valuable feedback, everyone. Thank you. Sarah, if you want to go back to the presentation. And next slide. Next, we would like to highlight six communities in North America that have undertaken some form of tourism planning with a focus on sustainable tourism. Five of these communities are in the United States and one is in Canada. My colleague, Sarah, will begin the case studies with the city of Sedona in Arizona. So Sedona, Arizona, this plan was developed in 2017. And like many of the communities that you'll see in the slideshow and Traverse City Tourism, is critical to Sedona's economy. Uh, they created a mission statement to communicate the goals and elements of the plan um, that you see here on the screen to, to lead to Sedona's tourism industry and embracing sustainable practices that enable the long-term health of Sedona, its environment, an excellent quality of life, long-term economic strength, and a positive visitor experience. The plan contains four strategic pillars that serve to organize the goals, objectives, and tactics of the plan. Environmental, these tactics include expanding programs to encourage minimal water use and new waste prevention, reduction, and diversion strategies. Resident quality of life, um, these tactics include new infrastructure and multimodal solutions to facilitate visitor traffic flows and the expanded use of technology to solve transportation challenges. The quality of economy, um, pursuing innovative approaches to employee housing and training, and then visitor experience, which includes deepening the understanding of current experiences of visitors and how to apply sustainable practices to them while they're visiting the community. Of the six case studies we're covering today, Charleston is probably most analogous to Traverse City. And while it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match, most of the ones we're covering today have a focus are more rural and environmental in nature. Charleston is certainly more of a developed city than the other five we're covering today. And as stated in the Charleston Tourism Management Plan, tourism represents an important facet of Charleston's and the region's economy. It provides jobs and economic opportunity for our residents while showcasing our, our city and its cultural resources to the people around the world. It also represents a challenge for our community. We must remain vigilant that tourism does not damage the city's authenticity and sense of place or negatively impact residents' quality of life. This requires careful planning and management. Next slide. The plan identified five goals, including management and enforcement, which focuses on gathering data about the tourism industry and visitors and implementing regulations and enforcing those regulations. Visitor orientation focuses on providing an enjoyable experience for residents and includes wayfinding, educational, relation, educational resources, and forming relationships with travel businesses such as airlines and car rental services. Quality of life focuses on balancing the needs of visitors with the tourism industry. Special events focuses on providing special events that highlight the area's culture and history and provide visitors with an opportunity to engage in an educational way. And finally, transportation and mobility focuses on creating safe and efficient and easy transportation network for visitors and residents. Next slide. Park City, Utah, this plan was developed in 2022. And since uh, 2002 Winter Olympics, Park City's experienced growth in tourism. And with its robust tourism economy, there were clear indications that the current state may become out of balance. So they were looking for a way to balance residents and visitors' desires. Uh, this plan includes five stewardship principles that are tied into each of the plan's objectives and initiatives. The environment is a value and respect for the health of the natural, natural environment and natural resources. 
a sense of place that fosters the local spirit, values, sense of place and well-being of the community. And this goes for residents, employers, employees, and visitors alike. Equality or equitable benefits that ensure the benefits of the visitor economy are shared equitably by people of all races, age, gender, identities, sexual orientations, abilities, income levels, and by the county's communities. Tourism leaders, this um, was to enable the county's tourism industry to lead by example, being a champion for tourism benefits, mitigating its impacts, harnessing its regenerative power for the community and the environment, and actionable principle to be bold, creative, and action-focused, supporting transparency and measurable outcomes. The Kauai General Plan is not a specific tourism plan like the other five are covering today, but it is a general plan, which is Hawaii's version of a master plan like the one Traverse City is developing right now. The general plan states that its policy is to uphold Kauai as a, as a unique visitor destination by focusing on revitalization and limiting new resort des designations. This shifts focus from expansion of the visitor industry to implementing a model of high value, low impact tourism that puts protection and qualities and values that visitors come to experience as a high priority. Next slide. So unlike the other plans, this doesn't outline specific goals or principles as they relate to tourism, but it does list many actions, some of which we've listed here. I'd like to highlight that the plan prioritizes revitalizing tourism areas rather than expanding tourism areas to undeveloped or non-tourism areas. The plan also recommends that resorts pay a portion of costs for infrastructure and public services. It, the plan increases wayfinding to ease congestion, provides opportunities for, for cultural learning and sensitivity, creates a sense of place through programs that enhance the cultural identity and language, attract a qualified workforce, and encourage outside companies to use and carry local products. Next slide. Uh, the Whitefish Sustainable Tourism Plan, this was just adopted in 2020. And of notes, 76% of Flathead County is mountainous public lands, which, which leads to tourism in the area. The purpose of the plan was to promote sustainable community-based tourism development that's beneficial to community members, employees, and visitors. This plan identifies five focus areas that are part of an interrelated system. They believe that each must be healthy for the system to thrive. So these five focus areas are environment, educating and engaging businesses, residents and visitors, and sustainability initiatives and encourage visitors to be sensitive guests while in the community, housing to expand the supply of affordable housing units to meet workforce housing needs by partnering with various stakeholders to offer a variety of approaches to meeting local housing needs, economic diversification, um, achieve economic diversity through an increase in year-round employment in non-tourism sectors while complementing existing uh, businesses, Tourism, managing non-resident visitation and local resident use patterns effectively to preserve quality of life, including identifying, measuring, and monitoring the city's tourism capacity. And then transportation, managing traffic to reduce congestion, promote safety, enhance connectivity, and to accommodate all modes of travel. The Yukon Tourism Development Strategy covers the largest geography of all the case studies covered today. The Yukon Territory in Canada borders the eastern side of Alaska and covers 190,000 square miles, almost twice the size of the state of Michigan. The Tourism Development Strategy states that to become a leading sustainable tourism destination, we must foster the conditions for a thriving tourism economy, develop tourism in a manner that balances economic, social, and environmental values, and bolster support for the industry by aligning our collective efforts with the core values of Yukoners. Next slide. The plan outlines eight key core values that cover preserving the wilderness, communities, and the northern way of life, leveraging the tourism industry to strengthen and grow the economy, manage the natural environment for the enjoyment of all, celebrate the natural environment, indigenous, indigenous knowledge, and preserve and share the past celebrate the Yukon culture, building healthy communities through job creation, community services and infrastructure, build partnerships to harness the benefits and opportunities of tourism, 
and foster innovative and creative opportunities for the tourism sector. Next slide. If we synthesize all of the case studies, there are really seven core themes that emerge. I would like you to rank these seven themes from most important for planning for tourism in Traverse City to least important. So Sarah, if you wanna to switch to Mentimeter. And while all of these factors are certainly important, it is helpful to gain an understanding of what you see as the top priorities, and then we can craft our strategies around planning for tourism in accordance with your, your priority ranking. Resident quality of life has remained a top priority um, by economic diversity and stability, environmental stewardship. So if you want to switch back to the presentation. In preparation for the workshop today, we pulled some data on the tourism industry in the region, county, and city. Before I jumped into the data, I wanted to gauge perception on tourism defendants. So Sarah, if you briefly want to switch over to Menti one more time. Next slide. So how much of tourism's Traverse City's economy do you think is dependent on tourism from a scale of 0% to 100%? We're just gauging perception here. We're not looking for any hard data. Kind of hovering around 65%, 65 to 70. And the 66%, two thirds of the economy. Okay, Sarah, if you want to switch back to the presentation. Next slide. So, beginning with the Northwest region, which includes the 10 counties of Northwest Michigan, about 33% of visitors come into the region for shopping, a quarter come for the beach and water, and 18% come for swimming, which likely overlaps with those beach and water visitors. These three activities were the most popular for visitors in 2021, according to a Pierre Michigan study. 69% of visitors come from within the state of Michigan, with Metro Detroit being the most common place of origin, followed by Illinois at 5%. And when traveling to and within the region, 83% of visitors used their own car, 5% rented a car, and 5% traveled via plane. In total, visitors spent just over $2 billion in the region in 2021. So if you want to go to the next slide. In 2022, Networks Northwest and Beckett and Rader conducted a seasonal population study, which aimed to count the complete population, including visitors, second homeowners, and full-time residents for every month out of the calendar year. As shown in that chart, for Grand Traverse County, the population of the county peaks in the summer months of July and August at roughly 160,000 visitors, 
59% of which are full-time residents. And in the winter, it drops down to about 110,000 people, 86% of which are full-time residents. Please keep in mind that these numbers just reflect people that are staying overnight in the county and not those traveling into the region for day use and sleeping elsewhere, maybe outside of the county in a neighboring community or just traveling for a day trip. Next slide. In Traverse City, which for the purposes of this data analysis, we're defining as the 49684 and 49686 zip codes. Looking at the economy of these two zip codes, 20% is directly dependent on tourism. So and thinking back to where our perceptions were, it's actually quite lower than what the group kind of came to a consensus on of about 66%. So 20% being directly dependent, an additional 7% is indirectly dependent on tourism. And so the 20% that is reliant on tourism is relating to tourists who have to go to you know, a business. If a tourist buys a sandwich from Mary's Kitchen Port or goes to Spanglish, that's a direct social relationship. But Spanglish and Mary's Kitchen Port have to buy ingredients to make those sandwiches. And so that's an indirect relationship. So 7% of the economy is indirectly dependent on tourism. And then finally, 2% of the economy is induced. And so an induced economic relationship are the economic production generated by the, work, the wages of the workers who are involved in the production chain. So the people who are making the sandwiches, serving the food, they earn income for doing that job. And how do they spend those wages? How does that impact the economy? When combined, the tourism industry accounts for about 28.6 percent of the entire economy of these two zip codes. Roughly 16,000 jobs are generated by the tourism industry, which accounts for about 28.7 of the total jobs in these two zip codes. Of the tourism jobs, 949 are food and beverage servers and 629 are retail workers, accounting for 40% and 19% of those two job types respectively. When looking at what industries are most reliant on tourism, Independent artists, writers, and performers are almost completely dependent at 92%. Wineries, I'm sure surprising no one, are roughly 70% dependent on tourist, tourism. Food and drinking places, full service restaurants, 59%, 49% respectively. And so if the tourism industry completely disappeared in Traverse City overnight, about half of the restaurants would close. Retail, both clothing and sporting goods, excuse me, retail, both clothing and sporting goods, have lower reliance on tourism, but are still over a quarter reliant on the tourism industry. Next slide. In total, the tourism industry is responsible for roughly 2.6 billion of the local economy. And these two zip codes, uh, which accounts for roughly 28.6% of the total economic activity, for every dollar directly generated by the tourism industry, another 36 cents is generated indirectly, and another eight cents is inducedly related this means that tourism has a multiplier of about 1.44, and a multiplier is just a combination of direct, indirect, and induced relationships. Economic multipliers are valuable metrics when looking at what industries create the most economic returns throughout the entire economy. Next slide. If we stack tourism against the other 274 industries we analyzed in Traverse City in terms of the strength of their multipliers, it would rank about 38th out of 274. So it would be higher than retail, general retail and hospitals, which have multipliers of 1.25 and 1.3 respectively, but lower than real estate, which has a multiplier of 1.61 and grain farming, which has a multiplier of 1.68. And the ranking of those industries are located below the multipliers. Next slide. In addition to an economic analysis, we also performed a location analysis using cell phone data. I would wager that most of us carry our cell phones wherever we go. And our devices capture and store that data when, when we travel. So we use this information to identify what areas of the 49686 and 49684 zip codes visitors travel to. Visitors we defined as anyone who lives more than a 90 minute drive from the city. But before I show the results of this location analysis, I want to acknowledge that there are privacy concerns when it comes to using location data derived from cell phones. I'm sure that when most of us are presented with a 200 page terms of services agreement on our devices, we just automatically click agree. And in most of those agreements, the party that is presenting that agreement says that they will store and sell your location data. And by clicking agree, you are consenting to that. 
If you don't want your location data captured or sold, you can turn off location services and the settings of your device, and that will prevent location data from being transmitted or sold. Next sign. The map on the screen shows what areas of the region are frequented by visitors in January. So the taller and redder the spike, the more visitors. As you can see, the regional malls. Sorry if you kind of want to circle the regional mall there. And South Airport and Division is a popular location, as, in the, as is the downtown in January. And then, Sarah, if you want to switch to the next slide. And this is what June looks like, or July, excuse me. I'm sure that the difference between January and July shocks no one, but you can see that downtown really increases in the summer, as does the regional mall and US 31 along the bay. Next slide. I wanted to highlight some of the locations on the map. You can see that the East Bay hotels in the areas along US 31 are heavily frequented in the summer, as is the airport. Downtown and the regional mall remain popular destinations. And then Meyer, which was also not frequented very much in the summer, is a popular, excuse me, very was not frequented very much in the winter, but is a popular summer destination. I also think it's interesting that you can see some of the outlying areas of the region are popular and frequent in five visitors. So you can see Boone's out in Long Lake, Moomers, and the mobile gas station on M72, formerly known as Grumpy's, out in rural Grand Traverse, the Illinois County. And so with that, we would like to move and open the conversation up to just general questions. We will have a discussion about planning for tourism in just a moment. So if you just have general comments or anecdotes, please hold them for that discussion so we can give them the adequate attention and discussion they deserve, but we would like to offer you an opportunity to ask questions about the information covered today or any of the data presented. So Lisa, I'll turn it over to you to facilitate this discussion. Thanks, Rowan. Yeah, if, if folks have questions, um, go ahead and unmute and we'll work through it if folks unmute at the same time and or you're welcome to chat your questions and we can respond to them that way. So this is a time for questions about data that Rowan shared, um, any case studies that Rowan or Shara discussed that you have um, more questions about. And then next, we'll move into a facilitated discussion in smaller groups about how this um, shows up for you in your daily life and, and based on your experience. So questions about the data, about the case studies, about the topic in general. And you're welcome to chat those or unmute yourself and share them. Okay. Okay, question from Alan Newton, Rowan in the chat. There was no data on the revenue for hotels and motels, why? Um, our economic analysis was looking at broader economic factors and while well, hotels and motels were specific industries with, within that economy, we took more of a, a holistic approach to looking at the economy rather than one specific industry. And it becomes very challenging to get um, quality data for a specific industry. And while we'll certainly explore the accommodation piece of this tourism planning, Planning, it, it wasn't something we were, were specifically trying to look at today. Rowan, the next question says, what does the data look like from five years ago, 10 years ago? What type of growth are we working with? Do we have an idea of how things have changed? Uh, we haven't done a, a historical analysis yet. That is a very good question and something we are intending to do. We were presenting on current conditions today. And so there will be a chapter in the master plan titled Planning for Tourism. And we're certainly going to cover that historical trends today and maybe get some ideas of where numbers are going. Um, just we can look at the Networks Northwest did a 2012 seasonal population study. And so we have compared those numbers from that report with the, the study that they just released um, a couple of months ago. And there was about, I think, a 12% increase from 2012 to 2022. Okay. Another question, are there numbers or connections between tourism and real estate? The argument has been made that more visitors has created higher demand on housing and higher valuations of homes. I can't point to a specific example. I think anecdotally, we all know that an interest in community and demand for housing causes prices and values to increase. And 
part of that demand and interest is due to Traverse City being a tourist destination and people wanting to live here or buy second homes here. As for a one-to-one -one an analysis, I, I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, Jonathan, we can certainly follow up with you and provide maybe some specific studies or analysis, and then we'll also include that in the, the chapter we're writing for the master plan. Okay. And then a question about tax questions. As it was presented, it seemed like implication was the area sees taxes from this, but there is no city tax or tourist tax that comes to the city or even county. Was that meant to be the indirect benefit from new build, et cetera? Um, yes and no. Um, there are state revenue sharing agreements as well that funnel tax dollars back to the city that are generated in the community. And then obviously the, the real estate taxes are generated from increased demand and speculation as we've kind of already previously touched on. Sean, I don't know if you wanted to add anything here about the relationship between tourism and tax. Okay, Sean says no. So. Yeah, I got nothing really additional to add to that. Sorry, Ron. And then I think we'll close out questions here with the three that are on the screen so we have time for discussion. Um, one is about plans for electric vehicle infrastructure around the city. I'm not sure that we have the um, time to discuss that here today unless, Sean, you have a quick answer for that. No, that's really more um, Traverse City Light and Power. Um, and okay. they have been rolling out charging stations throughout the city and plan to continue, I believe. Um, I know right now there is a little bit of hold up on supply chain issues with a lot of those components. So it's a little slower than they had hoped. Okay, thanks, Sean. Then um, how do the economic factors directly impact me as a resident paying the taxes to improve infrastructure for our city? How do they contribute? Yeah, I think that the benefits that you see are, is like certainly diversity of goods and services. You know, I mentioned that 50% of restaurants would be gone overnight if the tourism industry just upped and disappeared. And so you have more choices as a consumer in terms of the goods and services that you provide. If we just think about very common supply and demand, if you have more, more restaurants, more companies, more um, firms competing for consumers like you, it, it tends to drive down prices, you know, reducing costs of living. So there are those macro and microeconomic factors that are that are driven just by number of firms, number of companies in the community. Thanks, Rowan. And then last question, was real estate on your slide about economic drivers? Um, let me go back and check. Yes, it was. and so there, there is a very clear connection between increased interest maybe generated by tourism and the real estate industry. It's something we're gonna certainly explore in more, tap, more depth and, and flush out in the actual text of the master plan. And so you, if you are interested, and more of that detailed data analysis, I would definitely keep your eyes out for that chapter, which we're hoping to have done in about a month or so to be re reviewed by the leadership team. And all of those meetings of the leadership team are public meetings. So you're welcome to attend those and provide your input. Thanks, Rowan. Okay, I think we're ready to move to breakouts. Do we have a slide that frames that up? Yes, okay. So we've got about um, 40 folks on the call, um, give or take. So we'll have about 10 people in each breakout room. We've created four rooms to discuss these questions. Um, we wanna know, you know, we offered a, a broad academic def definition for what sustainable tourism um, is. We wanna know what that means for you um, as it relates to your experience in Traverse City. And then how can the city support sustainable tourism in Traverse City in the future? So we're gonna break out into those discussions. Um, with your peers and each of us. So Sean, myself, Rowan, and Sarah will be in each room to facilitate and help guide that discussion. We'll pull um, key themes and then come back as a group to report out what we heard. Um, I think it'll probably take 15 to 20 minutes to have that discussion in the breakout rooms and then we'll come back together around 3.20, let's say, and wrap up in next steps. Um, so you'll get a prompt shortly to join breakout room one, two, three, or four. Go ahead and hit that button. That will transport you to a separate spot. And then we will join you shortly to get started. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Sean, it looks like you're back. Sarah's back. But still missing Roman. Is that true? Yep, Roman's group, it looks like, is the only one. Okay. okay. Well, let's go ahead and... Um, he should be back, that that team should be back anytime. So let's go ahead and, and kind of report out what we heard. And Sarah, do you wanna start off with um, kind of high level takeaways you heard? Sure, so for our group, for what sustainable tourism means to you, 
Um, it really was talking about the equity between the needs of the tourists and the residents, what's needed for both and how to manage that. Um, we did talk about seeing money coming back into the community um, in some something like an example was fees for uses of the parks or tax on short-term rentals. And those were just an example um, to say, how could we see those fees or how, you know, how could one in the community see the direct correlation between the two? Um, and respecting the environment while allowing visitors and residents to kind of coexist together. So, and then for, do you want to go one by one or you want to do all of them? Go ahead and, and do the next two. How can the city support? How can the city support Traverse City? Um, so one of the comments that was made is that the city only controls, you know, eight square miles of all of Traverse City. And so there is a limited scope on what the city itself can do um, versus the whole area. Um, and there was a lot of talk about focusing on the infrastructure um, that's available to everyone and to be open to new types of business, agritourism, recreational uses, to be supportive and open to um, even businesses we're not aware that currently exist or are in the future. So um, I think we would do that either through zoning or some other regulations to allow the flexibility of those businesses when they do approach uh, Traverse City um, as being a member of the community. Great, thanks, Sarah. Sean. What did you hear in your breakout? Yeah, probably the word that came up the most is balance, um, balancing the needs of the residents and the desires of the visitors, balancing the, the housing needs with the workforce related to tourism industry. Um, one thing we heard quite a bit too was the importance of preserving and protecting our assets, our natural resources, our culture, our heritage, but at the same time, promoting it so people know about our culture and our heritage. Um, we talked about uh, the benefit of the quality of the experience versus the quantity of the experience. So the maybe not driving the numbers up, but having a better experience for those that do come and visit. Um, and that that the growth in the industry is, is planned for. It feels like it kind of in the last 10 years came up real fast on us and we're dealing with this growth without a long-term vision. And the other thing was um, more year-round tourism. So it's not all in the summer that we're we're activated in the winter months as well. And so what does that look like or how can the city support sustainable tourism? Um, one thing is uh, supporting those year round uh, events like the recent successful comedy festival that happened. Um, another one would be sports facilities. So it seems to be sports and events in the off season are what's gonna try to draw people here in the tourism industry. Um, in our group, it was expressed that they like the case studies um, and maybe it's time that the city start establishing shared values, vision, and goals around tourism. Um, collaboration, it's not just a city industry, it's a regional industry up here. So collaborating with our adjoining townships and municipalities, the county to understand that. Um, and again, working on that preservation, just making sure that we, we don't end up ruining what it is that we love. Sure, thanks, Sean. Um, we also talked quite a bit about balance when we talked about what sustainable tourism feels like in Traverse City, what that would feel like. That word came up quite a bit. And then in terms of how the city can support, um, there were, I think, four major themes that emerged. Protect natural resources in the city, work regionally, um, both locally at a local region level, but also with the state to maximize resource sharing and efficiency and leverage all that we can. Um, and then look to those case studies that were shared or other case studies to find communities that are similar to Traverse City. Um, if we can and, and see who's figured it out and um, what we can learn from them and then strike a balance between short-term rental and housing needs, particularly thinking about the density of short-term rentals so that um, thinking about how, you know, how they're, they're uh, being observed in our neighborhoods so that neighborhoods aren't, aren't becoming entirely short-term rentals was, was a concern shared. Um, Rowan, I think I saw you back in here. Um, what high-level themes did you hear from those two questions? Yes, I, I think our group certainly echoed a lot of what's already been covered, that there is a need for balance in kind of how we see tourism and visitors. And then we also, there was a, a huge emphasis placed on the balance between summer and year-round that we really need to focus on, on promoting Traverse City as a year-round destination. And maybe some of that promotion can can smooth out that summer flux or summer tension that we see. Um, and then we also kind of covered that there needs to be 
more of a focus on, on kind of going along with that year-round um, approach to tourism, focusing on year-round employment, year-round events, housing for those employees, and how can our transportation systems um, benefit the tourism industry, and to respect our natural area and natural features. And then there was also discussion, I think our group was fortunate to have representatives from TC Tourism and the events industry and the hospitality industry as well about focusing on attracting the right kinds of visitors to Traverse City. There, there was kind of some sense in our group that maybe the COVID years, the, the tourists that were coming into the community weren't maybe aligned with historical and recent trends and, and the types of people that were coming in maybe weren't respecting the values of the community as well, as opposed to those that had been coming on historically and, and that who are being marketed to and that we need to market to the right kinds of people, the people who will come to our community and respect those values. In terms of how can the city support, there was a huge emphasis placed on a need for an open and honest dialogue between the city and tourism operators and events and, and the need to coordinate between the city and those events as well. Um, and that can alleviate some, maybe some concerns or issues that have popped up before avoiding those knee jerk reactions, asking the questions, asking the dialogue, going through the dialogue. And then um, kind of promoting, showing our values as a community to tourists. So how can we promote our values to those who are coming into the community to make sure that they're respecting our natural areas? A good example was provided that um, special events are required to have signage that there are no smoking in the parks, um, you know, throw your garbage away here, throw your recycling away here, and, and why do we only have that for events? Why don't we have that year round? Why aren't those signs permanently posted in the park and, and just highlighting our principles and values kind of through that way year round, not just at these, these kind of main events or, or main tourism opportunities in the community. And then, you know, we also covered infrastructure and housing and how tourism relates to, um, to those two dynamics as well. Great. Thanks, Rowan. Well, I think there's a lot to say on this, and there's also a minute left. <laughs> so I think we'll move towards next steps and, um, and then perhaps look for additional opportunities. Um, there will be additional opportunities to engage throughout the master planning process. And if this is a topic that is really interesting to the community, um, we can continue to have conversations around this. Um, so Sarah, do you have the next slide on? Sure. Um, so to stay engaged, we have the leadership team meeting that meets on the first Thursday of the month um, at uh, the city that is updated on the website. The packets are on the city's website as well. You can sign up for regular updates, visit the tcmasterplan.org website. So we're posting chapters there. We have the community engagements are on, on the website. Um, also talks about who the leadership team is um, and there'll be more details that's updated regularly for you. In the springtime, we do have additional community engagement sessions coming up. So we're doing some neighborhood planning. We're gonna go out into the neighborhoods um, in the springtime, maybe April, to get some input on each of the neighborhoods. So stay tuned for that and when we'll be located near your neighborhood. And then we're also going to do some scenario planning. So there's going to be uh, three sites or corridors in the city on April 26th. We're going to take a deep dive into those areas and get some input from the community on that. So the location for that scenario planning and the timing is still to be determined. But um, if you sign up for the Traverse City update, either the tcmasterplan.org, you can sign up there, or even through the East newsletters on the city website, um, they will push those out through their Bay Brief weekly to let you know when those are happening. So thank you to everybody that came to attend and participated during our breakout sessions. Um, I don't know, is there anything else that we need to do before we wrap up? Just we have one more session in person tonight at the library, um, and then we'll be sending out a report of what we've heard today um, during these two sessions to all folks who are signed up for project updates and all folks who were invited to participate or signed up to participate. So you will receive that report um, that'll probably come out in a couple of weeks, I would imagine, um, just to give us time to, to sift through and, and pull out the key themes. So look for that. If you have questions or other ideas in the meantime, um, I will chat my email address here and you are welcome to reach out to me with any um, other thoughts. And we just really appreciate your time and input. Thanks everyone.